Okay, so um, we're going to start off just by talking about why we want to compost, of course. Um, and for me, you know, this, this stuff up here in the top right hand corner of your screen, this handful of what we call often black gold as uh, gardeners, it's, it's exciting as a process and I get more excited about it as the years go on, but it is still for me a means to an end. And of course, it just enables you to create this fantastic homegrown produce. Um, this is really what powers home food production. And um, what makes me excited about teaching people how to do it is if you can make good compost, then I guarantee that you can grow some really good veggies. And the examples I've got on screen for you here are a, um, a DIY wicking box that's been made in an old broccoli um, polystyrene box um, and you can see just the brilliant silver beet that's growing out of there and that is from the garden of Steve and Rabia North who are renters out in Altona with a very small courtyard garden uh, and so really terrific use of small space made possible by a small scale composting system that we'll have a look at later in the session. And in the bottom right hand corner, I just snapped this picture quickly of my friend Annie's little unit um, that she was renting uh, over in Brunswick. And I hope you can see from the scale of the picture, this is really about uh, maybe 30 or 40 centimetres wide, a strip of what was some pretty boring landscaping running along a otherwise quite concreted um, area in between some units. And um, in this season, Annie has just got a flood of basil and silverbeet and parsley and tomatoes, transforming a really small little strip of land into something that was growing a lot of her um, salad and, and cooking greens. So you don't need a big space to have a food garden. And we're not gonna focus much on the garden side of things today. Uh, but I just want to make the point that compost is really what enables that food production to happen in a small space. And there are, of course, some other really great reasons that we want to be composting. One of the reasons why councils are so keen to encourage it is that we know about half of every household landfill bin in recent years in, in metropolitan Melbourne has been uh, organics and, and food waste. Um, so that's by weight, not by volume. You may not see that if you open the lid. But food waste in landfill has been a significant challenge for councils. And of course, when food waste goes into landfill, it actually starts to release methane, which is a really potent and serious greenhouse gas. So this is one way that we can all take a little step towards um, addressing climate change at home. And um, we're really seeing a lot of support from councils now, including a lot of incentives and um, free composting systems in some cases uh, to help support you to do this at home. And um, Beck's going to chime in throughout the session and let people know from Stonington Council's perspective, who are funding today's session, uh, what uh, systems are available for you there. So um, today, uh, we're going to take a quick detour first, but these are the main systems that I'll be talking about with you in the order that we'll be talking about them. And my goal for today is for everyone to have a sense of the differences between these systems, because um, you can think that a composting system is, you know, they're all pretty similar. Actually, they're not. Uh, even different types of compost bins have got real pros and cons and so on. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is sketch out in which circumstances these systems are most appropriate and then leave you to experiment and, and work out which one really is going to suit your circumstances the best. So I hope that sounds like a worthwhile use of time. Uh, but before we get on to them, there's something else we need to talk about before we even get to the composting thing which is how do we minimise the amount of food that we are trying to compost? So I have a little challenge for you this morning. I've got a question on the screen there and I'd love you to think about if you've got any tips, any favourite recipes or ways of using these ingredients, what do you do with them? And uh, I wondered if we could all put some of those in the chat window to give each other some ideas this morning. So the question is, what do you do with your stale bread, leftover rice, citrus peel, cabbage leaves, beetroot greens, leek greens, carrot tops, wilting herbs, leftover roast chicken and overripe fruit? And of course, there's so many other things you could also put in there. Uh, so if you've got a favourite way of using those rather than sending them into a compost bin, pop that in the chat window for us now. 
And while you're doing that, I thought <laughs> it's a bit funny taking a photo of last night's dinner <laughs> and putting it on the screen for you. But I have done that because I wanted to tell you about one of the things that we do at home to minimise our food waste. And um, actually, well, there's two things in one in this photograph. This is a leftover reheated dinner from a lovely kind of vegetable lasagna um, that my partner made. And when he reheated it last night, he made it a little bit special by um, using a, um, I think it's called a pangrattata. Um, hopefully I don't have that wrong. That's an Italian term for a, a breadcrumb topping. And so this breadcrumb topping that you can see is um, uh, made from stale bread that we allowed to dry out and go hard. And then it was grated in a food processor into breadcrumbs. Uh, and then a little bit of garlic and some um, herbs were thrown in and a bit of salt and tiny bit of olive oil. And then it was just sprinkled on top of the lasagna and reheated. And um, they, I believe they call it poor person's parmesan in Italy because it really gives a very satisfying, um, creamy, salty um, deliciousness in the same way that parmesan cheese would on top of these sorts of dishes. And um, it's really special. And all of that from something that might otherwise have become waste. And this week on ABC Radio, um, they were talking about uh, food, uh, bread waste in Victoria. And so I pulled some statistics up there because it was just insane. For every loaf of bread that's eaten in Victoria, half a loaf is thrown away on average. It's costing us $800 million a year and because of all the water and energy and land um, that, that goes into making bread and, and the fertilizers and things, of course, uh, it would be the climate equivalent of removing 100,000 cars off the road to be cutting out that bread waste. So Sustainability Victoria is about to launch a campaign called Bread to Be More. Uh, but that just goes to show you how significant the issue is of all this wasted food that we're putting in bins. So I'm going to scroll back through the chat and have a look. Um, we've got um, Jane who's keeping a bag in her freezer and adding veg cuttings and peelings and old herbs and then once full is making veggie stock. So it's a fantastic time-honoured um, money-saving trick, Jane, and just leads to more delicious food. We've got Laura saying um, using leftover rice and chicken to make congee, delicious. Olivia's making breadcrumbs with stale bread like us. I also freeze most of my bread as I can't possibly get through the whole loaf in a few days and using leftover veggies to make soups. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, leftover chicken um, is going to chicken mayonnaise sandwiches um, from, is it Julia? I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Mary Jane, stale bread cut into small bite-sized pieces and give to, oh, give to wild birds. That may be worth commenting on actually. It's not recommended to be feeding wild birds because it can um, make them sick and also dependent on humans. So just gonna pop that in there, Mary Jane. Sorry to have to mention that. Um, but you're also using leftover roast chicken in stir fry with veggies or baked in a quiche, fantastic. Um, Denise is freezing bread and using chicken leftovers for broths and veggies. Uh, and Joyce is asking what congee is, and I may not be the best person to answer that. <laughs> I know I know roughly what it is, but maybe the person who mentioned congee would put a little description in the chat for us. Uh, I know it's it's very popular in Asian cultures, uh, but I wouldn't do do justice to describe it. Okay, so heaps of ideas for you there. Um, and uh, so once we've cut our food waste down to the minimum possible, and hopefully saved a bit of cash in the process um, there's other things that we can do to avoid food waste and this is pretty boring advice I'm not going to spend much time on it but we do know from research that just doing some planning for your meals and making and sticking to a shopping list uh, are really quite important steps so we'll leave that there the other half of um, having a successful composting system in a really small space is if you've got a garden, trying to minimise what you actually need to haul to a compost bin. And so that can really shrink the scale of the system that you need to set up. And I, I was just wanting to show you here the most simple, simple trick for minimising green waste, which is to um, 
use this technique called chop and drop, where literally you are maybe chopping off a, a branch of a fruit tree and then um, maybe breaking it up into pieces that are less than 15 centimetres long and just leaving them on the surface and allowing them to stay there as mulch. Uh, on the left hand side you can see um, this is just a patch underneath one of my fruit trees and I've got some bits of grapevine here and some grape leaves um, that I've raked up and I've chucked under the fruit tree. Um, this, I don't know, I don't know if you recognise this, this is a silver beet stem an old woody one from the veggie patch that I've just thrown under here as well. So it's a very lazy technique, but this will actually save me from having to buy in mulch and also save me from having to make my own compost. And if I scraped this back, you should see the worms and just the rich soil that it's creating underneath. Uh, and obviously allowing me to get away with not having a really big compost system in my very small garden. And on the right hand side here, I use exactly the same approach in the veggie patch. So this is taken yesterday and you can see my cabbages starting to look pretty good. And around them, I've got a mix of autumn leaves and I've also got the stems here from um, summer's bean crop that were just chopped down and allowed to stay on the surface as mulch. So really simple, but again, just minimising the materials that we have to deal with through these um, composting systems. Okay, next thing is that when we are starting to do small scale compost systems, pretty much every single one of them involves having some sort of scrap bucket in your kitchen. And it's worth just mentioning this and um, talking about uh, the options that you've got available. Uh, many councils these days are offering you caddies often for free or very cheap like this one over here and I think they're good but I wanted to put a note in for very small households and especially very waste efficient small households that if you wait until this bucket is full before you empty it which is the, the natural temptation by the time you get to the top things down the bottom might have been sitting there for four or five days potentially and by that point they are getting pretty manky potentially attracting some little flies um, certainly making the job of scrubbing out the bucket pretty unpleasant and um, so what I'm going to suggest is that if you're a small household think about the size container that you need for um, about two days worth of food scraps um, or, or even one day if you're really um, motivated and onto it and actually get a container that is that size and it will just make the job while more frequent a lot more simple and pleasant. So for us as a small two-person household um, this this I think it's a two litre ice cream bucket that we fill up every um, maybe two to three days cooking a, a lot of meals at home uh, this this is the right size for us and anything more than that would become quite gross quite quickly. Underneath it you can see my special um, brush, <laughs> I don't know where it came from, um, just found it lying around here but this is a perfect brush to clean out the buckets and I, I like to sort of have all the tools around at the outdoor sink and then when I scrub the bucket the water gets tipped onto the garden as well. I've um, got a few comments in the chat. Laura's asking, can I keep it in the freezer and would that cause any issues? No, Laura, that's great. Uh, if you've got space in your freezer and you can be bothered to open the freezer every time, then there's no problem with that at all. And of course that will extend how long you've got between empties before it gets some um, gross and you could potentially have it in there for a very long time. And um, Karen's giving us a great tip. I tear up old egg cartons and put them in the bottom of the bucket so it absorbs the moisture um, to reduce smell. So that's a great tip, Karen. Thank you. And um, oh, Beres is saying she also keeps her scraps in the fridge to fill up. So might have to add that tip um, of, of putting things in the fridge or freezer for future. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the actual systems themselves, starting with worm farms. And worm farms come in so many different shapes and sizes that I thought I would show you a few different options. Of course, most of you will have seen the one on the left hand side here, which is the stock standard 
commercial worm farm system. They all lose their legs eventually, by the way. So just be prepared for the legs to fall off at some point. You might need to um, have some bricks or milk crate to prop it up. And these ones, at least in theory, work by having a um, solid base with a tap for drainage and then layers like these two on top where you start feeding in one and then when it becomes half full, you put the second tub in and keep feeding on that. And the worms, as I said, at least in theory, gradually move up and allow you to harvest the trays below. Uh, what actually happens is you end up with worms in all trays. So we can talk about, if you like, how to separate them out as much as possible. Uh, but that's the way that these, um, these systems with layers are designed to be used. Uh, you don't have to though, you don't have to use one of those. Um, you can actually make your own worm farms out of all kinds of things. And one of my worm farms is in the centre here. And this is just a garbage can with some little holes for ventilation drilled in the lid and also around the base here for drainage. And we'll go on a tour of um, that worm farm in just a minute. And I also thought, I know this, it seems a bit crazy if you've got a really small space to have a, an even bigger worm farm, but these bathtubs converted as worm farms do work really well. And I thought, well, if you've got a tiny space and it can multifunction as seating, then maybe it's acceptable to have um, a, a larger worm farm. So that might be of interest to some of you. And this is Andy from a, a community group called the Urban Bush Carpenters who helped us to build and install um, one of these at uh, a community centre a few years ago. If you do this, keep in mind that the lid is actually going to get a bit moist under here. Um, and so that wood will need to be replaced or you might want to build it out of something that doesn't break down. Uh, also, just a pro of the larger worm farms is the worms are a lot more resilient, particularly in heat, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So there are some advantages to having a larger system like this. All right, so now we're going to go on a tour of um, one of my worm farms. So I'm just going to stop sharing that for a minute. And I'm going to start sharing, oops, no, I'm not. I'm just going to open my worm farm video and um, give you a tour. I'm having all kinds of problems with videos at the moment, hence jumping out to a different um, software platform to show you. Um, so bear with me. And hopefully you can see that. Beck, let me know if that's working well. Yeah, we've, we've got that. Okay, that's great. Oops. I've just managed to kill it. That was a bit silly. Trying to make it larger for you and I've minimised it instead. All right, here we go. So this is me going through that, um, that worm farm that you saw in the garbage can. brave you don't have any spiders in your worm farm? <laughs> no we don't um, I guess the point I wanted to make here is this is a, this is a really healthy worm farm this is what it should look like uh, you'll probably see lots of other creatures in here as well and that's completely fine and, and really healthy nature doesn't create systems with just one species or virtually ever and so a really healthy worm farm is going to have lots of diversity I've just paused it here as well out of interest you might like to have a look this is a little baby worm here um, contrary to some rumors on the internet that's what they look like when they're first um, emerging and I think that could be an egg there we'll just see if I can find some some more eggs oh, there's another baby just in there Oop, no <laughs> uh, so the eggs look like um, a tiny little yellow balls uh, that are, I would say, about three to four millimetres wide. Um, and around this time of year, you start to see lots of them in a healthy worm farm. So it's really nice to be able to recognise them. I'll go back into my slides again now. Uh, okay. Oh, here we go. I actually had, had a photo. So these are the eggs um, in here that you can see. It can be quite fun to recognise them. Um, these are mature worms that have that little band around them. So they're able to breed 
And then of course, there's every size in between and, and that looks like it could be a baby there as well. Um, so some things that we're gonna learn about worm farms now uh, are that the real basics, the, the things like food and temperature that are important for keeping them healthy. And I'm gonna send you some more comprehensive notes as well that um, go through each of these in a lot of detail. I really wanna talk about the main things that people struggle with um, keeping worms and um, focusing on those. So the food that goes into a worm farm, uh, it, it has to be mostly fruit and vegetables and things like coffee grounds and, and tea leaves as well are really good with um, some occasional sources of carbon. We're going to look at carbon in, in more detail when we look at composting um, bins and things in a minute. Uh, but for now, you could think of that as a handful of autumn leaves or a little bit of newspaper, for example. So worms need a bit of a balance between the fruit and veg scraps and some um, slightly uh, woodier or more, more straw-like carbon materials. They need not too much food. And this is really one of the main things that causes problem for people trying to get worm farms established is uh, when worms are establishing as a population, they can only eat really tiny amounts of food at first. And so, for example, when you buy a worm farm system, often it will come with 1,000 compost worms, and that will be on average a weight of about 250 grams. And there are really wild estimates out there for how much food um, worms can eat. But practically speaking, they're going to eat their own body weight in about a week or so. Uh, initially. So if you imagine starting with 250 grams of worms, it's actually a really small amount of food waste that they're going to be able to process until they start to breed and um, really fill up the worm farm. And you can get up to, you know, a kilo, sometimes a bit more a week. Um, and some households are going to need more than one worm farm. If you're, um, say, more than a two-person household, you'll almost certainly need to have more than one a standard sized worm farm to cope with your food waste. Uh, but the key point here is that when you're starting your worm farm, you've got to watch what they're eating and not just put more and more food on top. Uh, otherwise, it'll just start rotting and stinking and attracting flies and the, the worms will then be suppressed and they won't be able to breed uh, either. So what, what are we looking for? This is my garbage bin worm can, as you, you saw before. And um, see in this photo on the bottom left here how the things I added last have all gone a bit brown. Lots of them have disappeared. Um, I'm not able to recognise as much of the food as I, as I did when I put it in. So that tells me that, yes, I'm ready to put in some more food. Then the photograph on the right-hand side here is um, uh, the, the worms that have just been fed. And those of you who recognise Fajoas will notice that we've been eating a lot of those lately. Uh, but do notice here that I'm not covering the whole surface at once and I'm not covering them in a really thick layer. So we want about three centimetre layers ideally so that they can process them nice and quickly. Uh, and then I would, after taking this, have just put this handful of autumn leaves back over the whole surface to cover it. And um, then also covered them in the hessian sack, which is nice to do as well. Not essential, but really nice up here. Um, so what that carbon does is helps to suppress smells, um, it helps to prevent flies and um, also keeps those food scraps nice and moist and dark. And that's why the hessian bag helps as well. And that encourages the worms to come right up to the surface and feed and keeps the food waste nice and moist so they can eat it as well. So um, not too much is the key with food and the right stuff, but also not too little because you are actually keeping animals alive here. And what can be a problem with worms is if people go away on a holiday for a while um, and they aren't fed for a number of weeks, um, then they can start to struggle as well, just like any creature would. So for worm farming, it's good to have lots of um, small but consistent amounts of food to feed them for as long as possible. So you can go away for a week easily um, maybe two weeks, but after that you might need someone to add a bit of food for them. Next thing is the temperature. Now, air temperatures, of course, are different to soil temperatures and the, the bedding or the, the um, 
the sort of composting material that the worms are living in um, is like soil kind of and um, that temperature needs to stay within a certain range both for the worms to be alive and for the worms to be actually processing your food waste so if um, this stuff down here that the worms are living in gets below 15 degrees they'll probably live um, they won't if they freeze, <laughs> which they might in some other countries, depending on where you're listening from. Um, but they, they will stop really actively decomposing food waste if they get too cold. So um, ideally you want to keep them above 15 degrees all year round. On the other hand, if this starts to heat up above 35 degrees, then your worms are going to die. Uh, and that's a very serious problem for worm farmers in Melbourne, as, as you know, we have extreme summers here, sometimes getting above 40 degrees Celsius. And um, in those circumstances, you really have to focus on your worm farm and, and keeping it cool. Uh, otherwise, it's very likely that you'll have to start again. And um, so this is something that plagues worm farmers, particularly worm farmers that take summer holidays in Melbourne. So I need to flag that for you as, um, as a design uh, that you, uh, something you'll have to think about in the design of your composting systems. There are some tricks if you want to keep worms alive through a, a real scorcher. One of them is to um, take them to the cinema with you. Uh, no, I'm just kidding about that. But you can um, maybe bring them indoors if you've got a laundry or an undercover space that stays um, nice and cool. Uh, other people will cover them in a wet towel, which is like an evaporative cooler. Um, one really good and pretty fail safe trick is to freeze an ice cream container full of water and just put that on the surface uh, inside the container just put that in on the surface of the worm farm on those extreme heat days and that will create uh, a gradient of temperatures underneath it so the worms can find the most comfortable range uh, that's really good uh, but it is work right so you've got to be aware that this might be a problem uh, worm farms that you can bury in the ground, which if you've got a bit of soil where you live, that might be possible. They're more resilient because the worms can burrow down and then come back up again when the temperatures cool off. And as I said, larger worm farms like a bathtub are also very good because there's just more um, insulation from those external temperatures. Next thing is the, the moisture of your worm farm. Worms actually want very wet conditions, about 80 to 90% uh, moisture. And so if you squeeze a, a handful of your bedding, you want a couple of drops of water coming out, which will roughly equate to that. So they do really need quite wet conditions for best health, but they also need drainage. So um, whichever type of worm farm you're using, you need to make sure that liquid can drain away from it uh, so that they, um, they don't drown or it doesn't get stinky in the bottom. They also want air much like us, they breathe through their skin. And um, so worm farms over time will naturally get a bit compacted and it really helps the worms and also the decomposition of your food waste to fluff them up from time to time. And so you could, you, you could actually do that with your hands in a small worm farm wearing gloves, um, if that's uh, your preference. You can gently use a garden fork or trowel or you can use a compost screw, which we're gonna look at uh, in just a second. And finally, um, birds and rodents both love to eat worms. So that's a good reason to have a very well sealed system and also to have a nice tight lid on it as well. Um, let me know if you've got any um, questions on worm farms in the chat, because we'll move on to compost in just a second. Uh, now, so this is a little bit up for debate here, um, and I'm also interested in your experiences, but I thought I'd have a go at um, describing a typical house that succeeds with a worm farm. And um, it starts with, of course, having enough outdoor space to keep the worm farm itself and somewhere that is in complete shade in summer and, and possibly somewhere even cooler, maybe even indoors to bring the worm farm during heat waves. Uh, typically, 
worm farming households that succeed have some kind of small garden or pot plants uh, because of course you want to get some value out of the effort that you've put in and worm castings are a beautiful you know luscious compost so it's a real shame not to have anything that you can actually use them on and you can use them in indoor plants as well so it doesn't even need to be a significant space outdoors uh, if you take long summer holidays, you, you might find it's not the most convenient option for you unless you've got someone house sitting for you. As I said, you need consistent um, small volumes of food waste. They're not good with really big um, quantities dumped in all in one go. And um, you can't have very long breaks either. Otherwise, you'll just constantly be setting the worm farm back. And finally, it's, it seems to be really significant that you need to be a highly engaged household and you need to be interested in looking after worms because more so than the other systems we'll talk about, it is like adopting a pet and they are creatures that require pretty set, like particular conditions to do well. And so the photograph here of my friend Jody um, is actually showing uh, kids and so so kids and households with children uh, often really thrive with a worm farm because the kids are so interested in looking at the worms and seeing them and uh, sometimes touching them <laughs> um, so it, it is actually a great system if you've got uh, children in your household let me know what you think of that is that you is that not you um, let me know if you disagree if you've got other circumstances pop all that feedback in the chat window and uh, we'll move on now to compost bins so another really common option, of course, that most people have seen uh, in place is, is a compost bin. And the bin itself is mostly cosmetic, but can be quite helpful um, potentially to um, stop lighter things from blowing away. Uh, it's sometimes more visually appealing than just having a pile on the ground or that you can compost just directly in a pile on the ground. Some compost bins, like these really fancy decorated aero bins over here, have a leachate container in the base, which means that you can compost directly on a concrete or paved area. And these ones are also insulated, which means that the food waste warms up and decomposes a little bit faster. Uh, I don't, I'm not necessarily recommending them, and this, this is actually a very expensive type of compost bin, um, but just to highlight that it does have um, a couple of things that are different. And when you're looking at which compost bin should I get, you can look at some of these different features and decide whether or not they're important to you. Um, so with compost, um, I, I'm actually going to show you at this stage a small scale system. And then we'll talk about how to make compost and do it really well and successfully. And I'll also show you specifically how to make the system that's in this video. So let's hope this one works for me. Um, some of you I know will have seen this on Gardening Australia. This is a small scale composting system in a courtyard in Altona. So when you build up really good soil, you don't have to put in all that compost. No, that's obviously not working for me either. Let me just stop the share for a second and I will go in and um, find my alternative video. Sorry folks, I know this is frustrating. Um, let's try this version. Grains. Yep, that one's working and we'll go share screen. Okay, back. And all that effort and, and then you oh, have to leave it behind. Uh, sorry, shared the wrong one. <laughs> Quick time play. There we go. So all that, all that effort and, and then you have to leave it behind, which is wonderful. Now my compost alarm is going off at the moment and the sensors are telling me that there's something going on over here in the corner. <laughs> Your compost alarm is correct. Uh, we have our composting system over here. It's completely portable. Costa, would you like to get in there and grab a bucket? You got a second arm there. I still think you could have done it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so basically with the buckets, we have some holes drilled up the top just to let air in. And we have some holes drilled at the bottom just for drainage. 
So as you can see here, that's some of our finished compost. Oh. Basically, the great thing is if you need to move house, you can easily take the whole system with you. How much compost is your little system producing? Um, about half a tonne a year. And the great thing is that this system produces it in small amounts. So we obviously can't use half a tonne in one go here, so we can just use it as we need it. Okay, so just wanted to give you a quick video of um, that excellent system uh, from my friends Steve and Rabia North, who were renters in Altona until quite recently. Um, half a ton a year of uh, food waste being processed in some um, buckets in the back corner of their very small rental courtyard. And um, those buckets were um, all taken from a local Indian restaurant that they've developed a great relationship with. And um, a lot of our ingredients in hospitality come packaged in those buckets. So I just encourage you rather than buying them to just walk down to your local shops and talk to some of the restaurants there and see if they've got any that they'd like to give you. And we've certainly got a relationship now with um, uh, one of our favourite restaurants that we um, now go and visit and get these buckets from whenever we need them as well. I can see Karen says she's stolen this idea and loves it and it works amazingly well. Thanks, Karen. So pop some tips if you've got any in the chat window for us. So uh, now we'll just go back a step now and just talk about the basics of compost and what makes it work well. And um, we're not going to go into heaps of technical detail here, but there is one really important relationship that you need to understand to make good compost. And that is the relationship between carbon rich and nitrogen rich materials, because to make it all work and to allow all the microorganisms that live in compost piles to do their work and break down your food scraps, they, they must have a balance between carbon and nitrogen. Now your food scraps are quite a rich source of nitrogen. So what we'll need to add to balance them is something that's rich in carbon. And um, to work out whether something is rich in carbon or nitrogen, the easiest way I know how is a mental experiment where you think if I had a giant pile of this sitting um, in my garden for a few months, would it start to smell or would it be relatively stable? And if it would start to smell, then that's a very good sign that it's a source of nitrogen. If it would stay pretty stable, uh, then it's a really um, good source of carbon, generally speaking. And when you read about compost, you'll hear people read about greens, which are usually nitrogen, and browns, which are usually carbon. But I just caution to be, be careful with that because some things like chicken poo are brown and they are very much not a source of carbon. Uh, so that's why I'm using those um, technical terms and, and I prefer them. So there are some sources of carbon here. Um, we've got wood shavings and a bit of sawdust in there as well. We've got some autumn leaves here, which are um, just raked up from the street trees around Melbourne and we're, we're really coming into peak season for harvesting your autumn leaves so I encourage you to get out there and um, use them and we've got some straw down here as well um, which yes yeah, come off some farms in Victoria. There are some other things that are good sources of carbon as well and I encourage you to pop them in the chat window and let us know um, what you're using. Now, um, the rule of thumb for people getting started composting is that when you open your compost bin, when you start your compost, uh, your, your system in there, you want to start with a layer of carbon and um, that will act as a bit of a sponge. And so any juices that come out of your food scraps are going to be soaked up and, uh, and converted and, and they won't smell and they won't be lost. Uh, so an, a nice thick layer of carbon rich materials at the bottom of your compost bin is great. And then every time you go out and empty your scrap bucket, we're going to go for about an equal volume of carbon rich materials, unless they are a really, really rich source. And so sawdust and wood shavings um, are a, a very rich source. And I'm going to pop that table up there for you. Uh, so for those, you'd just be doing a, a very, very thin layer, of maybe a centimetre um, of those on top of your food scraps. And so we're actually just making layers like a lasagna and making sure that the carbon layer is always on top uh, because it's this carbon layer that suppresses smells and also um, discourages things like flies as well. So 
dump in the nitrogen, cover with carbon, dump in the nitrogen, cover with carbon. And that's how we, we build a really nice balanced compost heap. Jane is asking in the chat, how do you recommend storing gathered autumn leaves? Um, well, I mean, you, you can stuff them into any leftover um, giant plastic bags that you might have, for example, um, or into wire cages, that sort of thing. Jane, what we do is actually use some old olive barrels. They're 200 litre plastic barrels that have a really nice tight sealing lid, if you can picture those. And um, they're great because you can stuff them full. We can have a volume maybe, you know, five or six times if it was out in the open, crammed into these um, olive barrels. So they're really good space, space efficient storage. And they also prevent things like earwigs from breeding up in them because we use them in our veggie patch as well. Um, and from previous experience, I know you don't want to raise um, many generations of earwigs and then release them into your vegetable patch as mulch. It's not such a good idea. Um, obviously, wouldn't wouldn't be a problem if we were just using them for compost. Uh, so there you go, your compost ingredients and that the balance that we need um, being quite key. The other ingredients that are essential are air and also moisture. Now this time we don't want as much moisture as a worm farm. We want uh, like a damp kitchen sponge, if you can picture that. And the rule of thumb is if you squeeze a handful of your compost, we should see about one drip coming out. And that would be the equivalent of about 50% moisture. And um, we also need to have lots of air in there because to, to break down compost properly, we, we need to do it in an aerobic environment, which is uh, lots and lots of oxygen. And so lots of people talk about turning their compost heaps and lots of really passionate gardeners talk about how they love getting out there and turning their compost. I'm a very passionate gardener, but I'm also a bit of a lazy gardener. So um, the way that I incorporate air is using one of these compost screws that you see here. And um, these compost screws turn in like a corkscrew and then allow you to just pull them up a bit and it will fluff if you like, fluff up your compost pile. And um, maybe it's not quite as good as turning it all with a, with a fork, um, but it certainly does the job. And so I might have to wait a little bit longer for my compost, but um, it's certainly breaking down really well and I'm very happy with it. So that's an, actually an excellent tool and I, I try not to recommend many tools, but I do really recommend these for people composting because they're such, a, such an efficient uh, labor saving tool. Okay, so coming back now, uh, oh, sorry, Rupa is saying I've been looking for these compost screws and haven't found them anywhere. Well, that's interesting because um, they are available at nurseries and hardware stores. And I wonder if there's a shortage out there, if anyone else has had trouble or if people want to put a source in the chat window. You um, can actually get them from the online um, website, which I'll chat about in a second, that called the Compost Revolution. Oh. Um, and lots of uh, councils, including Stonington, have a discount available to oh. residents. Good, good news. And I know Beck's going to talk about the compost resolution more in just a second, but that's really great to know. Actually, while we're talking about the compost screws, um, if I just go back a second, see if you can get one of these ones here that's not painted, because there are ones which come with a, a paint coating and just inevitably flakes off. And it's not something that, of course, you want going into your soil or, um, or your food systems. Uh, so I really like these unpainted ones if you've got a choice. Thanks for that link, Beck. Uh, all right, there's lots of words on this slide, I know, but I know some of you will want the detail. Um, I, I interviewed Steve and um, grilled him about exactly how he'd set up that bucket composting system. And these are the instructions, which will also be supplied in the notes that you'll get through Beck uh, soon. So for people who are interested, this is how he's retrofitted those buckets and some pictures of the base and the, the bottoms of the container and also the lid as well. Now, what Steve actually does to create that compost uh, is he has a mixture of some sawdust or wood shavings and some soil or compost uh, inside in the kitchen. So that's this bucket here. And he also has another bucket not shown that he's collecting the food scraps in. 
And so he's actually kind of making a mini pre-compost inside and then emptying it into the buckets outside, which um, probably isn't essential uh, if you're going to empty your scrap bucket outside every day, um, but just letting you know exactly what he does. So um, they'll in the, in the kitchen, they'll put their food scraps into another bucket, then they'll um, sprinkle about two cups of this sawdust mixture on it to cover it every day. Um, occasionally they'll add some water to bring the moisture up to about 50% as we were just talking about. And then when the bucket's full, then it will go outside into one of these composting buckets and um, sit there for about three to six months, aerated with a compost screw occasionally until it looks something like this <laughs> beautiful mix here. And it is actually some of the very best compost that I've ever seen. Uh, so yeah, I know this system works beautifully. And Stephen and Rabia have um, recently moved house and of course the composting system has moved with them. Uh, so really brilliant and very scalable system for people who are renting uh, and, and might need to pick it all up one day and move. Okay, so to think about who succeeds with compost systems. Um, the, the sort of components or, uh, you know, the design parameters are, you've got to have enough outdoor space, of course, for the system. And again, it makes the most sense if you've got a small garden or some pot plants that can use all of the compost that you're creating. Uh, although I'm sure you could give away your compost and gardeners like me would gladly accept it, uh, the effort that you're putting in for most people means you want to actually be able to use it yourself. You will of course have to have some sort of regular carbon supply, um, newspaper and cardboard if they're not um, heavily inked uh, can also be good low budget substitutes um, for people who can access them. We love using autumn leaves because they're abundant and free. And some people will use um, straw, even though you have to pay for it. So I, I tend not to um, encourage that. And uh, if you can find a clean source of wood shavings or sawdust from um, timber that hasn't been treated or painted or varnished, uh, that can be a real asset as well. So you will need a regular supply of carbon. It can also work for people who've got other things they want to compost like prunings or grass clippings. Um, it works for people who are away from home regularly or take long summer holidays in contrast to worm farms which can be a lot more challenging and it also works if you suddenly have a large volume of food waste that you need to compost um, where a worm farm would really struggle to handle a, a large load coming all at once. So there's the compost bin system. Let me know what you think of that. Um, and um, before we move on to some others, I'm going to look at a stinky compost bin or a worm farm and what we do to fix it, because this occasionally will happen even to the very best worm farmers or composters. So um, let's imagine that you've got a stinky compost bin and maybe you open it and there's a flood of little flies that come out at you and oh it's horrible and putrid what are we going to do to fix it um, well the first thing especially if it's a worm farm is we want to take away excess food scraps um, that may actually have been causing the problem in the first place if there was too much added or um, too much of the wrong foods and the worms couldn't process them. So we just want to take away that the source of that problem. Then the next thing that we're going to do is aerate. So um, again, the compost screw is very helpful, even for worm farms, uh, to fluff up this mix and put oxygen back into it. Um, that goes a long way to suppressing smells as well. Then what we're going to do is check the balance um, and also for worm farms, even though you don't usually add lots and lots of carbon, if you've got a smelly worm farm, then um, definitely adding some carbon rich materials will help. And um, you may want to mix some through the pile to just address that balance if it seems off. But definitely either way, cover the whole thing with a layer of carbon materials. It, it's actually, it's very impressive and always amazes me how quickly smells go away when you add a layer of carbon on top. So a thick layer of autumn leaves, you know, a blanket of wood shavings, that sort of thing um, will help deal with the problem quite quickly. Then we want to stop adding any more food scraps until things come in back into balance, which could be a couple of days. 
uh, and that will go a long way to helping uh, stinky compost bins and worm farms. The other problem that you might have is all those little flies that can be really annoying, even if they're not directly uh, a problem for the compost or the worm farm. And um, I have this little trick, which usually works wonders that I wanted to share with you, which is how to make a vinegar fly trap. And we, ca we call these vinegar flies because they're attracted to fermenting fruit um, predominantly. Um, so what we do is we mix up a quarter cup of apple cider vinegar, or to be honest, you could just use some fermenting old fruit <laughs> uh, or probably other types of vinegar might work as well, but apple cider seems to be a favorite for them. We're gonna dilute it with a bit of water and then we're gonna add a, just a couple of drops of um, soap or dishwashing liquid. And what that will do is reduce the surface tension so that the flies can't land on the liquid and um, drink it, they'll fall in instead. So you can see here, I've got some already that have um, fallen in and drowned. And these are quite cheap traps to make. So you can set quite a few of them if you want to. And um, you can put them even inside worm farms or, or compost bins or around them. And what this will do is just really rapidly reduce the populations uh, so that you deal with the really, what's really a PR problem of just having a compost bin full of little flies. Um, it's a really helpful trick if um, you're ever in the situation of needing to deal with them. Okay, lots of talking from me. I'm gonna hand you over to Beck to talk about the Compost Revolution Program and how you could get access to a um, compost bin or worm farm more cheaply. And uh, not just in the city of Stonington, but many councils have signed up for Compost Revolution. Beck's gonna talk specifically about the arrangement in Stonington. Yes, sure am. And um, not too much to say, but just that we have joined the Compost Revolution at Stonington. We've been part of it for many years now. Um, and it basically just means our residents can get uh, access to quite cheap subsidised products through the uh, website. So uh, basically council pays a big chunk of um, uh, the price of what you see on the website so that you get 40% uh, off a range of products. Um, and we also pay for delivery. So that will come straight to your home address. Um, so there's a whole bunch of products available. There's um, different sizes of worm farms, there's different types of compost um, units, and there's bakashi as well, and then a few accessories. You can obviously get your live worm farm, your compost aerator, as we were talking about before. Um, and yeah, it's all done pretty simply on the website, um, which I popped in the chat and I'll do so again, and also send it um, in a follow-up email. But basically you just put in your, um, your address, so that will let you know if your council, if you don't live in Stonington, has a, um, a it, your discount will automatically come up if you get one. Um, and then it will just get sent through to your council um, and will get approved by someone there. And then the order will get processed. Um, and one um, condition in Stonington is it is just one product per household. Um, so yeah, it's um, just, you know, Based on today, you'll have a really good idea of what kind of system you want. Um, and um, yeah, we'll be happy to approve your orders. So I think that's all I have to say on Compost Revolution. Uh, and we also have, yes, thanks, Kat, um, another program which I wanted to talk to you about. So this one's specifically for apartments. Um, and this is just knowing that we have so many apartments in Stonington. It's actually 75% of our population is living in medium um, to high density. So it's it's a huge chunk of our um, city. Um, and we want more apartments composting um, and using worm farms to keep that food waste out of landfill. So we have just launched this new program whereby we are giving out free compost bins and worm farms to Stonington apartments. So it's a pretty amazing deal. Um, that you will hopefully be quite excited to hear about. So the two products that we have through this program is the solar cone composter, um, which gets very, yeah, thanks Kat, the one on the left there. Um, the bottom half of that, as you can see, gets um, buried into the ground and sits kind of the, the lighter green section sits flush with the, well, disappears um, out of the ground. And it has this uh, little, chamber um, inside that the green blue section 
um, that allows the compost to heat up and get quite warm and so therefore can um, process compost um, a little bit quicker than your traditional um, home compost. So it's, it's really good for apartments to have a bit of space um, that they can bury that into. Um, and the other uh, option is the hungry bin worm farm, which is essentially just a, a quite a large worm farm. It's kind of the size of a beery bin. Um, and again, is really good for shared spaces. Um, you might want um, one or two or three of each of these systems, and you can receive up to three of these systems, depending on how, um, how many people live in your, uh, your block. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the Hungry Bin Worm Farm is pretty, pretty great. I think once it gets up and running, it can process a couple of kilos a day. Um, so another really good option. Uh, and when you get, um, when you sign up to the program, you get the free fully subsidized um, worm farm or uh, solar cone. And you'll also get a workshop for your, um, for your block. So that can be in person or it can also be online. Um, we know people who have run it um, in person, having a wine night, wine and worms, um, and making a little bit of a social occasion and connecting um, with residents. And we've had some really lovely um, feedback that people have met residents, met, met other people in their building that they hadn't, um, hadn't connected with before over their worm farm or composting. So um, and another really nice element to add in there. Um, and just the one, one of the things to mention is that you do need uh, a bit of support from others in your apartment. So it can't just be one person ordering these. We want to see that um, there's, you know, a big uh, proportion, well, at least 30% of others in your block who um, want to see this initiative get up and running. And then, of course, the uh, owners corporation um, need to sign that one up as well. But yes, free for uh, stunning to apartments. apartment. Uh, and we also can supply the uh, kitchen caddies um, that we that Kat talked about at the beginning of this session, but also a great option is just to use a smaller container, especially um, uh, for the reasons Kat mentioned. And there's along with the workshop, there's a whole bunch of support resources and online um, info available to help you um, set this up. And well, someone will help you set it up, and uh, but to help you keep it up and running. Mm. I think that is all I need to say on that one there. Thanks so much, Beck. Um, Ju Julie, Judy, sorry, has noted in the chat that her apartment has the Hungry Bean Worm Farm, which has been fabulous. So it's really great to know that's working well for you, Judy. Uh, so many, so many different styles of worm farms and compost bins. I can't sort of fit them all into the session to talk about each one. But if you have particular questions about, you know, which one and why and <laughs> how they work, feel free to ask at the end. I'm happy to go through them with you. All right, we're going to move on to some other types of composting systems now, starting with Bikashi. Now, Bikashi is interesting because it's not a full composting system on its own, but is it's a way of preserving your food scraps in a very space efficient way so that they can then be either buried or composted, uh, but quite infrequently. So you, you may not have to do anything uh, until, um, say, every two to four weeks. Now, <laughs> I'm nervous, but I'm going to try and show you another video. So I'm going to stop the share for now. And I'm going to um, try to open my um, Bikashi videos so that I can take you on a bit of a tour. And I do apologise for how frustrating videos are being today. Um, I'm going to go into empty Bikashi bucket video with VLC. Um, and then I'll share my screen with you so that you can see it too. Um, is that good, Beck? Beck, we've got that, yep. Great. This might be a little choppy. Yeah, it's going to be very choppy. So uh, I'm going to show you a few of the components um, of the, the bucket. We've got a, a valve down the bottom that we can open and close, and that's how we drain um, liquid off um, that accumulates in the bucket. Um, then um, on the inside of the bucket, this is, this is um, without any food scraps in it at the moment, you, we've got a false floor that um, drains liquid away. Um, and I think I should just show you underneath. Whoops, it's a rather manky base, but that's the, uh, that's the, the tap outlet um, on the inside. Um, and then 
and um, we replace that um, and we've got a really tight fitting lid on the top and that's quite important because Bokashi actually works the opposite of compost it works best in anaerobic con conditions which are without the presence of oxygen and so that's a commercial Bokashi bucket but you can actually do Bokashi with um, your own DIY system which I'll show you in a second as well um, so I'm going to um, just open another, hopefully open another video for you um, so you can see feeding the Bikashi. Let's try this one. Got that back? Yeah, that looks pretty good. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so this is what it looks like when you've got a bucket up and running. You'll see that's the, the previous layers of food scraps and then there was a bit of Bikashi grain, which I'll explain in a minute sprinkled on there. So the food scraps go in, including you'll see a bunch of onions and things in there which are not always recommended for systems like worm farms. So one of the real advantages of Bikashi is you can put an extremely wide range of food scraps in here without causing any issues. Then the next thing I'm doing is I'm mashing those food scraps down. And the reason I've mashed them down is to, again, compress air out of them. Also, it just really um, makes the most of the space in the bucket. So you'll be surprised at how slowly the bucket actually fills up, especially when liquid is being taken off it. And then, and then I'm sprinkling some Bikashi grain on the top. Um, just have a quick, oh, I have to go back a sec. Have a quick look on there at just how little Bokashi you use. Um, so this, this Bokashi stuff is a grain that's been cultured with a particular community of microbes that will pickle food waste instead of allowing it to go putrid and stinky. So it's making a, a pickle, if you like, not, not an edible <laughs> pickle, but a, a pickle that's going to start digesting these food scraps before they get into the compost bin or get buried. Now you have to usually buy this stuff unless you're a real enthusiast. And the average household is probably going to spend about 50 cents a week on Bokashi. Um, that's worth noting for some people you won't want to be spending anything at all in which case this is not the system for you uh, other people might go oh that's that's fine but I'm happy to do that but if you use too much Bikashi you will go through it a lot more quickly and it will cost you more money so it's worth just looking at how much you actually need to get the um, right fermenting effect so after we've sprinkled on the Bikashi then the last thing we'll do is just put on that lid nice and tightly uh, and from there, I'll jump back into my much more reliable slides and um, show you some pictures there. So this, um, sorry about the scungy buckets up here, but this is a DIY Bokashi. This is what it can look like. So if you go to visit your local restaurants and get some of their old buckets, this is a yoga bucket, of course, you can have a solid bucket with no changes underneath. You can have a bucket resting inside it which has got holes um, drained in, uh, drilled in the bottom for drainage. And then you can have a tight fitting lid on the top to keep the oxygen out. And that is actually gonna function in exactly the same way as the Bokashi bucket down here, um, but potentially um, you know, cost you nothing and also have um, uh, the, the benefit of using some materials that might otherwise be wasted. So feel free to make your own. And the only things that you can really get wrong with a Bokashi uh, not draining the liquid off because it, if it sits there it can start to get quite smelly so you do need to drain liquid off about every week and the only other thing is that the Bokashi grain is a living thing so you need to keep that grain stored somewhere that's not you know in direct sun it's not exposed to extreme heat or cold and it doesn't last indefinitely so if you um, notice that it's not working you might need to go and buy a fresh packet but other than that, Bokashi is one of the easiest things to teach people um, and there's very little that can actually go wrong with it. And so for that reason, it's a good one to mention. And if you're in an office block um, or if you're in a house that's got lots of people who aren't really engaged and interested in composting and who might put all, all sorts of um, uh, wrong foods in a, a worm farm, for example, Bokashi is 
a, a good system because it accepts almost everything. So a typical Bakashi household that might succeed is one where they, they don't have any outdoor area for a compost or a worm farming system. You have to have someone who can carry a heavy bucket because it will be a bit heavy once it gets full and it will need to go somewhere else where it can either be added to a compost bin, again with a layer of carbon on top, or buried, ideally about a foot deep to um, suppress smell and to prevent rodents and dogs and things. And it's hard to estimate exactly how often you'll need to do that, but I'd say the average is every two to four weeks. If you know that you've got a big rodent problem where you live, Bakashi is good because it's in a sealed bucket and actually most people have it indoors in their kitchen. Uh, so yeah, it's a very well contained system in that respect. If you can afford the small ongoing cost, it's good. Uh, as I said, if your household's not really interested in learning other methods, it's good. But you will need to have um, acceptance of the smell of pickles. So good Bakashi shouldn't smell bad, but um, I've learned from experience that what smells bad is very, it's a very personal thing. And so if you don't ever like the smell of anything fermented, then you're probably not going to enjoy Bakashi. Uh, it might not be the right system for you. Anne has just ordered her Bakashi bin from the Compost Revolution. So I hope um, you're excited about that, Anne. I hope it goes well. All right, the next one we've got is a system called share waste. And this is where we're actually moving to options where you're not actually composting anything on site. And I think this video will work. So we're gonna actually hear from the founders of share waste on Gardening Australia. <laughs> Newtown is a trendy suburb in Sydney's inner west. The gardens here are few and far between. Not somewhere you'd necessarily pick as the epicentre of a new wave of composters. But this is a suburb that's always been known to attract young people and creatives. Thinkers, doers and advocates for change. Thomas and Ellie moved here from the Czech Republic. Their lack of garden meant that their food scraps were just going to landfill. But they took matters into their own hands. I'm a software engineer, so I decided we could, you know, maybe we could write an app that would solve that problem for us and for someone else as well. The app connects people who live in small spaces with people who have compost bins. So let's say you're a donor. So you hit the first, first button and you see a map so that's showing all the different hosts. Yes, correct. And then you can just zoom it in and look at how many are there across Sydney. It's growing. <laughs> you can send a message to arrange the drop-off um, for the host. And, you know, you arrange the details, like when, when the drop-off will happen and what exactly can you bring. I like that it's so simple. You either want to give or you want to receive. Yeah, that's it. I think that in Australia we eat much more veggies and fruit because everything is just fresh and seasonal and we love it and we buy it but then we realize that most of our garbage bin is just full of compostable beautiful scraps which could go right into the garden and we put it in the garbage bin but at the same time we weren't able to have our own compost bin or our own worm farm because we were renting and we didn't know for how long we were going to stay in the apartment the journey through the neighbourhood to drop off the compost has become a weekend ritual. Their host, Lachlan, has a pretty small backyard, but it's big enough for a hefty compost bin. And he's more than happy to share. All up, I've got about five regular people who bring me scraps. I take scraps sometimes every fortnight, sometimes once a month. And, and then I've got people who visit me as one-offs. Nice to see you again. Hi. Hey, nice to see you again. Costa. We come bearing gifts. Fantastic. Here they are. Let's have a look. Okay. Reveal. There's a sack reveal. That's looking good in there. Mm. Thank you. I don't feel like I'm doing them a favour. I feel like they're doing me a favour by bringing me their food scraps, which I turn into wonderful compost. Sweet. Thanks see you. a lot, Lachlan. Bye. Bye. The areas where I've been 
put in compost. It's dark and rich and full of earthworms and it's just full of life. Lachlan also accepts fermented food scraps, which he digs straight into his soil. Claudia is another apartment dweller and she brings her bin around once a month. It's been uh, sitting in the bin for about three weeks. Uh-huh. Uh, obviously, it's all, like, uh, vegetarian stuff. Just chuck it in. Fantastic. I use a fermentation system, and it actually takes about four weeks it has to stay in the bin. The actual system is uh, enclosed, so if you keep it um, well closed, you won't have any smells or anything throughout the house. So it's pretty handy if you live in an apartment. Imagine if every block had four or five compost bins and all their neighbours were bringing their food scraps to those compost. All that food waste no longer in landfill. All that fuel, all, that, all those garbage trucks no, no longer shifting food waste around. And the benefits in terms of a community that actually knows each other and gets together around compost. I think it's awesome. Now that the online community has gone global, it connects like-minded composters in cities all over the world. It's awesome to see technology turning waste into a nutrient-rich resource. I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, and um, you would have seen the Bikashi scraps that were referred to as fermented food scraps there at the end. Um, now, as I said, there's lots of different perspectives and ways of doing things. Um, you heard them say that they need to sit for four weeks before being buried. I actually don't agree. Um, it just will take them a little bit longer to break down in the soil because they haven't had all that time pre-digesting. So you don't need to worry about that. Now I thought we'll open up the Share Waste website and have a bit of a look. And if anyone's currently thinking, oh, this could be, this could be it for me, uh, let me know where you are and I can um, look up your suburb if you like, pop it, pop it in the chat window. I have opened it on the Stonington area just to show you what's available. And we've got these um, grey markers here and that's a Share Waste system which is registered but may have enough people already linked in so they can't take any more. But then we've actually got um, these green ones here which are potentially accepting scraps. So you can click on them and see Maria who's in Charles Street who's accepting fruit and veg and has four other people who are connected with her, for example. Um, let's say there's not as many in Stonington as in some other areas. So let's move over here. We'll have a look at the Camberwell area, or actually, should we head a little bit further north? And you'll start to see, well, a bit of a flood, <laughs> a bit of a flood around the, the Northcote Brunswick area. We've also got people who have got chickens. Um, oh, that one's disabled, sorry. We'll check this one here. People who've got chickens, uh, who are accepting food that the chickens can eat. We've got, um, oh, what we've got here? got a kitchen garden where you can also take food scraps so some community gardens are registered as well and I think sometimes you see a cafe um, a cafe that's actually registered and you can come and take their food scraps if you um, want to add them to your home compost system um, Denise is asking about Karen Downs so we'll just do one um, search and we'll see what's out your way. Whoops. Have a look, Denise. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you've, you've got some out here. So obviously won't put in your address. But um, it has been impressive to look at how many people are using this software, which is often one of the issues is getting that critical mass up and running. Um, but it looks like we do have quite a great spread of options all around Australia these days. So I do encourage you to have a look on the share waste option and potentially if you're composting, maybe it's something that you could offer to your local community as well. So there's um, the share waste system. We'll go back into... Um, PowerPoint and we'll have a look at what makes share waste the right choice. Firstly, I, I think it's good to acknowledge that for a lot of people, the idea of regularly just going for a walk for the sake of composting might not be 
um, you might not be you. So it really does suit households that are very environmentally conscious and happy to put in that extra bit of work. And of course, um, households that just won't benefit from making their own compost or worm castings because they don't have plants or um, uh, any way to put those systems. You, of course, need to factor in a regular walk and also with your scrap bucket. So if you can't see yourself doing that, then it might not be right for you. And um, you don't always get to take cost out either. So that's also good to acknowledge. And um, you have to enjoy making these community connections. So um, there's nothing wrong with not enjoying that, but it's something that will happen as a result of share waste. And it's more successful for people who really enjoy um, those community interactions. It's a really great option that we've got. And then the last system I wanted to discuss with you today is curbside collection or food waste going into green bins, also known as Food Organics Garden Organics. So sometimes you might see this acronym FOGO. And so this has been a more recent development in Melbourne. We have councils that are now accepting food scraps in some green bins, but it really depends on where you are in Metro Melbourne. So you'll need to call your council or check the website and work out if this is something that is offered where you live. In the city of Stonington, the food and green waste bins are this burgundy colour here, and sometimes they're different colours or have different coloured lids. So check it out where you are. Usually there is an annual fee. It's quite an expensive service um, that council offer, as in expensive for councils to run. So there's a fee and for Stonington, it's about $120 a year. So if you, firstly, you have to be in an area that offers it. And secondly, you have to commit to the annual fee. This also suits people who don't have any space for a compost or worm farm system or um, the plants uh, to receive the compost. It also might suit people who have a really large amount and can't deal with it on their own site. Um, at you, um, oh, I think I've got my, maybe got that the wrong way around. Um, so you need, you do need to have an extra wheelie bin space on your site, which I know some houses might struggle with. And it may actually be a good choice if your household is just less engaged um, and doesn't think any of the other compost systems are a good fit for you. So um, it is probably a system of last choice because there are so many additional benefits to keeping food waste local and improving local soils and encouraging local food production. But if I'm honest, probably the majority of Melbourne households are going to be best suited to um, curbside collection at this stage. So if you're not a gardener, you're not really engaged with um, compost, then this is uh, a good, probably a good fit for you. And it's great that we have this service available now. Uh, and I'm going to let Beck talk a bit more about what goes on in Stonington with this collection. Yeah, thanks, Kat. Um, so we uh, launched this service to the community about a year ago. Um, and previously, it was just a green waste service, a garden waste service. But a year ago, we said, right, you can put all of your food scraps in. Um, we have about 13,000 households participating in this system. Um, and in the last year, it kept about four and a half thousand tonnes of food and green waste out of landfill. So um, when you look at it um, at a, uh, you know, municipal scale, um, it's, it's awarding a huge amount of um, food in landfill and, you know, the carbon emissions that um, come from that. Um, and yeah, we're, just, we're trying to roll it out to, to more people in the community. So um, please help us get the word out. And if you know someone who, um, perhaps uh, composting um, or worm farm isn't a, a good um, option for them, um, then please recommend the Food and Green Waste Service. And we do have um, a few people I know on who have registered their Food and Green Waste bin on Share Waste. Um, so if you do have your own um, bin, you can always, and it's not getting um, full, uh, you can always pop it on Share Waste. And there's a few different ways to manage um, smells and, um, and that kind of thing. It is a fortnightly collection, so some people have some issues with it getting a bit stinky. Um, you can keep your food waste in the fridge or in the freezer and then just pop it out on um, bin night. Um, you can also add your yeah, cardboard and, and newspaper and that kind of thing. Um, and just with the Food and Green Waste Service, it, it takes a wide range of, um, of things that you wouldn't put in your, um, your compost. So everything from um, 
meat and dairy products to um, to uh, bread and, and grains and um, onion and citrus and all of those things. So um, good option for lots of people. That's all I have to say. Thanks very much, Beck. And it's a really similar principle there for suppressing smells. You know, when you add your nitrogen rich food scraps to your um, curbside collection bin, covering them with a layer of carbon, that's, that's the, the basic principle that helps to avoid smells. And um, you could also have a layer down the bottom of the green bin to soak up any um, leachate that might come out of those scraps as well. So you can apply these principles in lots of different ways. Um, now, so we're coming to the end of what I wanted to present. If you've got questions, feel free to pop them in the chat so that we can get to them at the end. I'm going to do a bit of a wrap up and a summary of the systems for you. And um, this is some key information. I haven't really covered all of this elsewhere. So I did want to highlight for you what can go in each of these systems. So here's a, a bit of a standard table now there will be composters out there who are going oh well I put this in my worm farm and and I put that in my compost bin so you can stretch these a little bit particularly if it's a very small quantity it won't matter but for people getting started it's good to know what's definitely acceptable and what's a little bit iffy <laughs> and needs to be treated carefully so you'll notice in worm farms that um, while they could handle the odd squeeze of lemon that gets chucked in the worm bin and um, you know maybe a little bit of onion and garlic you certainly can't have lots and lots going in there or the worms will get pretty unhappy and um, things like bread in a worm farm tend to go blue with mold a long time before they break down so um, that's the sort of rationale behind this table and you'll notice that worm farms in particular are quite limited and that's that's a really key point it's worth understanding because she can take almost everything except I've said grass clippings and prunings and that's more just because spatially you'll be filling up that bucket too quickly and same for the worm farm. Um, compost we tend to discourage um, especially beginners from putting in anything dairy or meat and fish because they can attract rodents to the bin. Uh, and then as Beck has just mentioned, the curbside collection or FOGO can really accept everything. So it's a very flexible um, system and, and it's great that we've got that available. If you're really heading for zero waste, you could actually have a Bakashi system that then gets emptied into a compost bin and that allows you to actually do everything quite successfully. Um, and as I said, there, there's a lot of grey area in here. So it's really just a list to help beginners get started. Uh, okay, so finally, what are you going to do with your scrap bucket? I'm keen to know. And I thought I'd end with um, just some summaries and reminders of the key things that we've talked about. So worm farms work really well for highly engaged households with small gardens and pot plants who produce small amounts of food waste, don't take long summer holidays and have somewhere cool that the worm farm can be placed in summer. Compost bins work really well for households with a garden or pot plants and a source of carbon rich materials, which by the way is really best positioned right next to the bin. So it's really easy and convenient to use. Um, you may take long summer holidays and you might have larger or more variable quantities of food scraps. Bakashi is best for households that can afford a small ongoing cost that like the smell of pickles, can occasionally carry a heavy bucket somewhere to be composted. Share waste is best for environmentally minded households without a garden or pot plants who are willing to take a regular walk with their scrap bucket and enjoy community connections. And curbside collection is best for the less engaged households that don't have a garden or that produce very large quantities of food scraps who live in a FOGO council area and can afford the annual fee. Now that there'll always be exceptions to these things, but I hope that paints a picture of just the differences between these systems and um, which one you might lean towards as a household. And so from there, we, we can take some questions, but um, maybe we'll um, just say thank you from me and, um, and just good luck with whatever choices you make out there. And I hope uh, it'll allow you to get that food waste out of landfill and, and put it back to good use feeding. Stuff.